Good morning, students. Uh, today we talk about uh, uh, today we talk about a book, and uh, not only about that book. Uh, essentially, society uh, around that period in time when this book was composed, uh, that is Mahabharat. Mahabharat is not something that you haven't uh, heard about or you don't know the story of. Every Indian knows what Mahabharat is about. Okay, whatever faith he might be coming from. But all of us know what Mahabharat is about. So in the previous chapter, we saw there were several changes in economic and political life between 600 BC and 600 AD. Some of those changes influenced societies uh, as well. For instance, the extension of agriculture into forested areas transformed the lives of forest dwellers. Craft specialists often emerged as distinct social groups. The unequal distribution of wealth sharpened social differences. Students, you have to understand that 600, uh, the period between 600 BC to 600 AD was very, very instrumental and uh, um, it, 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 it left an imprint uh, on the other great civilization uh, that was the Chinese civilization, which again happens to be uh, the, one of the uh, ancient civilizations of the world. And uh, students, why Chinese and Indian civilizations are unique, uh, let me just kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, brush... Uh, this thing uh, is uh, is that Egyptian civilization was also a very ancient civilization. The, the Mesopotamian civilization was a very uh, ancient civilization. But you have to understand one very important thing: that these civilizations came, reached reached their zenith or their pinnacle, and then they disappeared. Okay, but it is only the Indian and the Chinese civilization which have been surviving they have continued with whatever it was okay without uh, uh, like for example if you go to the areas of mesopotamia no one is following the mesopotamian civilization now everything is islamic there it's the same thing with uh, egyptian civilization if you go to egypt today no one is praying to the sun god the way they used to now everyone is praying allah because Egypt happens to be an Islamic country. So that tradition is broken. Unlike in Indian civilization or Chinese civilization, whereby what we were doing and what they were doing for 4,000 years BC or 5,000 years BC, it still has its imprint in the traditions that is being followed in, whether in India or in China. Okay, so uh, coming to this paragraph, that is the last one. In focusing on the Mahabharata, the colossal epic running in its present form uh, uh, into over 100,000 verses you know, with depictions of a wide range of social categories and situations, we uh, draw on one of the richest texts of the subcontinents. As students, let me... Uh, 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 let me express my, uh, uh, you know, kind of disagreement with this use of the word richest text of the subcontinent. Uh, subcontinent, it is NCRT wants you to believe that it is only known in the areas about India and Pakistan and Sri Lanka and probably Bangladesh or, or Nepal. Uh, uh, students, this is not the case. Okay, you have to understand Mahabharata is considered to be a classic and one of the greatest works of literature by historians, the uh, uh, by the historians and the people who deal in uh, matters of spiritualism, who deal in matter of philosophy, everything, uh, right from people from all the cultures, right from Russia to Argentina and from America to Japan, everyone knows what Mahabharata is and what Mahabharata is about and the teachings of Mahabharata. So it is not just about subcontinent. So, uh, you know, this is uh, clearly not the case. Now, it was composed over a period of about 1000 years, that is 500 BC onwards. Now, students, again, uh, you have to understand that it was composed over a period around 500 uh, BC. That doesn't mean that the events happened around 500 years before Christ. Okay, uh, because it is uh, uh, very obvious that 300 years, uh, uh, around 300 years uh, BC was Alexander the Great. Ashoka, Chandragupta Maurya were there at that point in time. And Mahabharat, the tales of Mahabharat, the teachings of Mahabharat, Bhagavad Gita, they had been there, um, you know, 2000 years before Chanakya was there, right? And 3000 years before Chanakya was there. So, uh, come 
the composition was done, assembled, they, everything was brought together maybe around 500 years before Christ, but the events did not happen 500 years before Christ because you have to understand, students, that in many parts of the ancient world at that point in time, the, the, the tradition of uh, the and the tradition of imparting knowledge was always through uh, verbal. It was not written. Okay, so it went on from generation to generation through verbal teaching. Okay, people used to remember those things by heart. You know, it, you it, if today we find it difficult to remember even one paragraph word by word. But you have to understand that people uh, five thousand years ago, uh, four thousand years ago, they used to remember everything word by word, and books and books. It's 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 impossible, and it appears to be fantastical. But that is what the tradition was. The tradition of learning at that point in time was for many many centuries it was always by uh, oral teaching and the writing came much later much much later in all the cultures and civilizations and that is uh, exactly when writing developed into uh, when the script was completely developed the uh, the form of writing was developed when the writing materials had been uh, perfected then Mahabharat uh, was written, that is about 500 years before Christ. This is the year and that, uh, you know, you should be thinking that this, yes, it was composed, but the events did not take place 500 years before Christ. Okay, so, so coming to uh, so the next page, the critical edition of uh, Mahabharat. One of the most ambitious projects of scholarship began in 1919 under the leadership of a noted Indian, uh, Indian Sanskritist, uh, V.S. Sukantar, a team comprising dozens of scholars initiated the task of preparing the critical edition of Mahabharat. What exactly did this involve? Initially, it meant collecting uh, Sanskrit manuscripts of the text written in a variety of scripts from different parts of the country. The team worked out a method of uh, comparing verses from each manuscript. Ultimately, they selected the verses that appeared common to most of the versions and published these in several volumes running into over 13,000 pages. The, uh, the project took 47 years to complete. Two things became very apparent here, that there were several common elements in the Sanskrit versions of the story and uh, evident in manuscripts found all over the subcontinent from Kashmir and Nepal to the north of uh, Kerala and Tamil Nadu in south. Also evident were enormous regional variations in the way in which the text had been transmitted over the centuries and as uh, uh, students, let's stop here. Uh, students, you have to understand, it's the same thing that uh, happened with the other important uh, uh, text of those times, that is uh, Ramayana. Uh, when you take uh, Ramayana, different uh, authors from different cultures, whether it was um, in South India, in Tamil, or whether it was in As Assamese, or uh, apart from uh, Valmiki, uh, I'm talking about, whether it, uh, whether it was in Assamese, whether it was in Bengali, all these, uh, um, in all these cultures, uh, the same story of Ramayana had been given given its own um, specific treatment you know um, because different cultures have extracted uh, different things out of it because they wanted to extract different things out of it and naturally the priority of uh, the bengali culture uh, would be different than people down in the tamil world would be more interested in certain aspects of ramayan and um, those in bengal would be interested in certain other aspects of ramayan okay so uh, it's the same thing that is being talked about here that uh, when mahabharat uh, uh, was also given treatment in different parts of uh, the country, different people from different cultures, different authors and different, of course, their uh, uh, spiritual masters. When they looked at Mahabharat, uh, you know, ev naturally everyone was not interested in the in the same stuff. You know, when we so say, for example, if you go to a place, uh, you know, say if, it doesn't mean that everyone would end up liking the same thing and everyone would end up disliking the same thing. It never works that way. And it was the same here. So, uh, 
Our understanding of this, the, the coming to the last paragraph, our, our understanding of these processes is derived primarily from the texts written in uh, Sanskrit uh, by and for Brahmins. When issues of uh, social history were explored for the first time by historians in 19th and 20th centuries, they tended to take these texts at face value, believing that everything that was laid down in this text was actually practiced. Subsequently, scholars began studying other traditions from from works in Pali, Prakrit, and Tamil, and uh, as we just uh, uh, we just discussed, students, it was the same thing that in a country which is as uh, large and as with such a high population and as diverse as India, it was but natural that uh, you know when people, different people from different parts of the country, from different cultures, when they started uh, writing these things on their own, studying these things on their own, they extracted uh, what they felt was best suited for them. And depending on uh, what they believed uh, were more strongly uh, compared to something uh, something other which, which they did not much believe in. So kinship and marriage, many rules and varied practices. So students, why have we picked up Mahabharat specifically here and we started this chapter with it is because most of the rules of families and social interactions and social values, uh, students, it's come out from Mahabharata, okay? And some very and, and some very important uh, uh, books of those times, uh, of course, Ramayana, something that we all know of. Students, these are the works which which decide and which set the rules for the society, okay? Like, for example, Ramayan tells you about how a brother should behave with a brother. How, what should be the behavior of the elder brother with his younger one, the younger one with his elder one, uh, how the father should be conducting his affairs with his son, how the son should be respecting his father. And the similar thing goes, uh, the tradition goes on in Mahabharat, whereby the, the rules of the society are set through these things okay through these works that is just just look at your own life around you how you talk to your own father how you talk to your own sister your mother you know your how marriages happen within your family how the issues of birth and death is dealt dealt within in your family all of that has been taken from these works which uh, date back centuries and centuries ago so, and this is something which happens in all the cultures. It's not just uh, uh, that something which is uh, unique to uh, Indian culture or the Hindu culture. Certainly not. It is. It happens in all the cultures. The ancient works, they are the ones that determine uh, how the society then conducts it itself in future. Okay, and uh, this is whether in terms of uh, marriage or inheritance, in terms of uh, you know even how they should be fighting against each other. So everything comes out of these things. And Mahabharat has been particularly chosen uh, because there is something which is very famously said about Mahabharat students. And later, a lot of books it took this uh, uh, proverb about Mahabharat, but it was first said about Mahabharat uh, that what is here in Mahabharat can be found somewhere else as well. That is in some other book as well. But what is not there in Mahabharat cannot be found anywhere else. Think about it. We shall continue.